All right, y'all, welcome back to Anti-War Radio Chaos 92.7. Oh, thank you very much. I'm Scott Horton. It's Anti-War Radio. And our next guest, our, our guest today, I guess I should say, is Andy Worthington. He's a historian over there in uh, merry old England and is the author of the Guantanamo Files. His website is andyworthington.co.uk. Welcome back to the show, Andy. Yeah, hi, Scott. Nice to be back. Oh, it's good to talk to you again. How are you? Yeah, I'm well. I'm very glad to be able to talk to you because there seem to have been uh, crappy things going on lately, and it's uh, you know nice to have a chat with you about them. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I have trouble keeping up with all the different things that need covering on this show, and I can usually only fit a couple of interviews per show, and that's you know if I get them arranged. And I can't keep up with all the different things. I'm glad that. Uh, you have such focus on uh, what's been going on at Guantanamo Bay and the different cases in the courts and so forth. Kind of keep me up to date, make it sound like I'm actually smart and know these things myself. Uh, so here's what I do know. There's um, a video's been released of the interrogation of the Canadian uh, miner, Omar Khadr, who was uh, captured in Afghanistan in uh, 2002 when he was uh, 15 years old, and I was going to get a, a clip of the audio of, of this, but then I figured, what's the point? Anybody can look it up at McClatchy newspapers and, and see this video, and basically the most important parts to me was, first of all, uh, he was talking about wounds uh, or injuries uh, to his shoulders and complaining about a lack of medical care, and then, of course, just the outright desperation when they leave him alone in the room and he's pulling his hair out crying, somebody help me, somebody help me, and it looks very much like a minor child in custody, not a seasoned terrorist warrior. Yeah, I think that's the big issue as well, isn't it? And I mean, what I've noticed over the last few days, it seems extraordinary to me, is how many people um, who I would think are probably quite reasonable for most of the time in their lives are really, you know, outraged about uh, about people having any sympathy for the plight of this boy. And you know, it's that issue. I don't know what I don't know what the problem is with people understanding that if you don't have a cut-off point, where you know where somebody's a child and they've been led. Now this is this is somebody who is accused of uh, the murder of an American soldier. Now there's a separate story as to whether Omar actually did that or not. There was another person around, and the uh, military tried to keep that hidden for some time. But if he did, we're talking about a child soldier. We're talking about somebody who was dragged into a situation. Where, where he's not old enough to make his own choices about it, you know. And, and the, the kind of violent opposition to any kind of sympathy that, that, that I've seen over the last few days has really, really quite shocked me, actually. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, well, I don't know. It's, uh, I guess, easy to just think of him as part of the other or something like that, and so it doesn't matter. I'm not exactly certain how that works. Being an individualist, I have trouble seeing things that way. But, you know, it occurred to me... Well, I, I saw some talking head on TV say, well, it doesn't look like they're torturing him in this video. I'm like, oh, great. Well, he is talking about the permanent injuries to his shoulders. Uh, no exact uh, explanation as to how he got those. I don't know if you know. Um, uh, well, that was from when he was, when he was shot. Um, you know, he was very, very badly wounded when, um, after the firefight in Afghanistan when he was captured. I mean, they... They saved his life, but, um, you know, they then started interrogating him almost immediately. And, I mean, it's pretty horrific, the stuff that was going on in those early days. There are kind of stories from Bagram about them um, making him, the soldiers making him carry heavy weights when his wounds were not even healed and stuff like this. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not pleasant. You, you wouldn't want to be hearing about this with somebody who was a grown and competent adult, but he was a 15-year-old child. You know? Right. And, you know, if this was footage of a 15-year-old who... I don't know, broken into somebody's garage and stole their lawnmower, and now they're in juvie, and they're sitting there crying and saying, "Wah, well, somebody help me. But we all know they're going to go to family court and that their mom and dad are going to get them a lawyer and that everything they'll at least have due process or something. There's not much sympathy in that situation. But to me, it seems like this kid is in a situation or, or was at the time that video is taken, uh, and I guess still is, but the despair that he's going through as he's sitting at that table is knowing that there is no light at the end of this tunnel. There is no family court. There is no nothing where he's going to get to actually make a case, defend his, his self from these people. I mean, the newspapers call these trials, but they leave off the ironic quotes. 
Yeah, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. And this kid's in a legal black hole, and that, to me, is torture itself. Imagine being in prison and knowing that, oh, no, there's no judicial check on this. You're already guilty. You're an enemy combatant. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's, there's other issues as well, aren't there, Scott? You know, I mean, it's even, you know, I mean, the crucial thing that, you know, that everybody should be coming back to, really, is, is he's a child. If you don't have a cutoff point for this, where the hell is that going to take you? You know, you could you could have any kind of situation where with, with you know smaller children, and and if they're being misled by a parent, it's like I don't care, they're responsible for their own actions. But you know, even if Omar had been a little bit older, what I still don't really get about this is that I understand that he's a Canadian in Afghanistan, but he he was it was a war situation. You know, what happens in a war is that if you capture people, you hold them as prisoners of war. You know, he's just another part of the whole process that's happened where. Where this is the first war that if you fight in, you're, you're a terrorist. You're not a soldier at wartime. Right, and this is something that we talked about last time, too, was that the accusation against this kid is that he threw a grenade, and this is, you know, the Washington Post version or whatever, quote, in a firefight. So how the hell is that a war crime? This guy wasn't putting civilians on trains to the death camps. Right, yeah, well, I know exactly. It's a kind of scale of things, really, isn't it? Yeah, the whole thing about enemy combat, well, he's not wearing a uniform, so he's illegal, and he's outside the Geneva Conventions, laws don't apply to him. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I've just been, I've just been looking, looking today, actually, for something that I, that I was writing for somebody about the, the kind of differences in the way that people have been held in various, various theaters of war. So, you know, we've got the whole story of Afghanistan and the, the people that are still held in Bagram who have not even the limited rights that the Guantanamo prisoners have. We've got Guantanamo, we've got Iraq, where they're called security detainees. But in all of these places, the same thing has happened, that in wartime, it's somehow still, by a lot of people, considered acceptable that you're not either holding people as prisoners of war and not abusing them and, you know, holding them until the end of hostilities. And you're not treating them as criminals. And if that was the case, you know, charge them, get them lawyers, put them in a courtroom, let's uh, thrash it out, have a verdict. Um, it's this third category. And, and to be still going on with this third category of people who are, you know, just spell that one out to me again, what is it? Oh, they have no rights. They have no rights whatsoever. You can, if you wish... Not tell them what they've done and hold them for the rest of their lives. You know, how, how, how are you getting away with that? I really don't know. It's funny, you know, you read about some of this stuff and, you know, when they talk about the torture of uh, Hamdan, I think, for example, or Abu Zubaydah in the new book, The Dark Side, she talks, uh, Jane Mayer talks about the torture of Abu Zubaydah. They put him in the little coffin, locked him in a little box. I don't know if they buried him in the ground or not, but, you know, you have this kind of thing where... Oh, and there's doctors present. That's yeah, the thing. Yeah, yeah. There's a doctor there to make sure that when he's almost dead, that they bring him back to life so they can torture him some more. And yeah. you know, when we're this far down the rabbit hole, I don't know, I don't know how it's ever supposed to get right again until after everything burns down or something. I, I just don't know. I mean, it's been like this for years too. That's the whole thing, and we've all known this stuff for years. I suppose I just hope one step at a time that that. Because I know that so many, I mean, and I really, I really do believe, you know, an enormous number of, of people in the United States, as well as people around the world, are aware that there are certain uh, barriers that you shouldn't cross. Um, indefinite detention without charge or trial is one of them. You know, uh, flying people around the world to be tortured in various prisons is another one. Torture full stop. You know, not, let, let's not be redefining it. Uh, it it's a story that... You know, I, I, it's been in the press for such a long time now, and I do feel that, that it kind of builds in depth as things go on. I haven't read Jane's book. I've read a lot of what she's written. I'm looking forward to it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, as time goes on, there's more opportunity and there's more depth to the story to understand that, yeah, they, they, they pushed ahead with this, despite the advice of uh, wiser heads who said that, you know, this kind of bully boy tactics is really not the way to get information, as well as really not being very good for the people who do it. It's not a good position to be in. But it isn't going to get you the reliable information. And I think, I think as time goes on, more of those voices are coming through of, of people saying it didn't have to be this way, you know. This, this information could have been extracted without having to do this. Yeah, in fact, some people are even saying, which I don't buy this at all, but I've heard the argument that, well... I could see how in those very early days when they didn't know what was going to happen next and, okay, they tortured Abu Zubaydah and Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. But to continue, the fact that they continue with this program, 
or continued for so many years and I guess still are at the torture dungeons in, in Bagram and Thailand and God knows where. That's the real problem is they certainly, even if it's just a policy difference we have here and that kind of thing, the way Democrats look at this kind of thing, still they should have learned that their policy was not working. That, As you said, beating the truth out of some guy only beats what you want him to say out of him, not necessarily the truth. It doesn't work. And you know what I think is another worrying thing about it as well is that if you... If you're torturing somebody and you're getting them to tell you stuff, either you're, you know, either you're posing questions to them and they're coming up with the answer that, that you want, or, or let's take it that you're, that you're saying, tell us the people that you know, tell us some plots that we don't know about. 